the Big Mac. So yeah, thank you for watching. I'm Daniel, and I'll see you guys in the next one. So of Tech, signing out. Cheers. But no, in all seriousness now, Apple sells a lot of Macs. In fact, did you guys know that it have 10 different Mac models to choose from? So I get why a lot of people, especially the ones that are looking to buy their first Mac, are a bit confused as to which one to get. Well, fear not, because I've used a lot of Macs over the years. So here's my comprehensive breakdown as to which Mac is the best one to buy in 2019 for each specific person and for each specific task. Okay, so if you're an elderly person or someone that doesn't really care about computers that much and only wants something for web browsing, social media, watching videos, and literally nothing else, honestly, don't get a Mac. Don't get a Mac, but buy an iPad instead. I've recommended an iPad to a lot of my family members. I got my grandmother an iPad as well. So yeah, for viewing content, it is by far the best device out there. It's very easy to use. The battery life lasts forever. And literally anyone can just pick it up from young children to your grandparents and they can start using it immediately. And in terms of which iPad to get, get the iPad iPad. So yes, the baseline of the baselines, that one is good enough already, but if you want something with a slightly better display and better performance, get the iPad Air or even a refurbished iPad Pro 10.5 inch. Pro tip, get that one instead of the iPad Air. You can still find it uh, on the Apple Store, on the website, in the refurbished section. It is the best bang for the buck. Okay, but what if you need something to do actual work from? Uh, well, if your work consists mostly of writing emails, organizing schedules, Word, Excel, all that, and you also travel a lot, then get the 12-inch MacBook. At just 0.92 kilograms, the 12-inch MacBook is by far Apple's most portable Mac ever. It is heavier than an iPad at 456 grams for the Wi-Fi only iPad Air, uh, but even with iPad OS just around the corner, that major OS redesign from Apple, which allows the iPad to support external mice, a new file browser, and more, it still doesn't match Mac OS in terms of, you know, doing actual work. The only downside to the 12-inch MacBook is that it hasn't been updated since 2017. So do keep that in mind. It is quite slow, so personally, I would wait for a few more months until November or so, when Apple's rumored to be releasing the brand new 12-inch MacBook and a few more updates to MacBook Air and the MacBook Pros as well. Also, the keyboard is quite bad, so it is Apple's second-generation butterfly switch, which breaks very, very easily, and you can barely even feel the keys, and yes, the webcam is just 480p, but hey, you get Apple's most portable uh, laptop that they offer, or Mac in general, the 12-inch MacBook, if you care about that, then, you know, the 12-inch MacBook is the one for you. Now, if you don't need the thinnest and the lightest and the most portable Mac yet, but you still need a portable one that has an even better display, it's a bit more powerful, has a fingerprint sensor, and a better keyboard with Apple's third generation butterfly switch, well, in that case, get the MacBook Air. So I would recommend the MacBook Air to students the most. Uh, with a 12 hour battery life, this is the perfect Mac to carry around at your courses. And you even have two Thunderbolt 3 ports, which the 12 inch MacBook lacks, as it only has that single USB type C port, which means that with Thunderbolt 3, you can connect a 5K monitor or an external GPU, and you can actually use the MacBook Air as a proper gaming machine, if you really choose to do so. And thanks to having two ports rather than just one, you can charge your MacBook Air and use an external hard drive at the same time, which again, you cannot do with a 12 inch MacBook because of that single port. It also has Apple's T2 processor built in, which means that if your MacBook Air gets stolen, you'll be able to locate it even without Wi-Fi. Uh, this will be enabled in macOS Catalina this, uh, this September. Now, if you need something a bit more powerful with a better display, then get a 13 inch MacBook Pro without a touch bar. So it only costs 50 pounds more than the Air. And like I said, you get a brighter 500 nit display with DCI-P3 color gamut versus sRGB gamut. Uh, you also get a more powerful 2.3 gigahertz dual core processor versus the 1.6 gigahertz low power one that the Air has. Uh, you also get better speakers. The GPU is also significantly better than the Air. Uh, we have the Iris Plus Graphics 640 versus the UHD Graphics 617 on the Air. But the baseline Pro does lack in quite a few areas when compared to the Air. So for example, battery-wise, we get 10 hours versus 12 hours on the Air, and the keyboard is still the second generation butterfly switch rather than the third gen on the Air. It's also a tiny bit heavier than the Air, but realistically, I wasn't able to tell the difference between the two weight-wise uh, when I was holding them in my hand. So I would recommend this MacBook Pro to photo editors or media production students, or even computer science students that just need something a bit more powerful than the Air, but for the same price. Okay, now if you're constantly compiling apps and you need a more powerful CPU, then definitely go with a 13-inch MacBook Pro 
with a touch bar. So this one costs $500 more than the regular 13-inch Mega Pro without a touch bar. It's quite a bit more expensive, but it does give you a quad-core processor from dual-core, uh, which is also Intel's 8th generation versus 7th uh, generation architecture like we have on the non-touch bar model. We also get a better display with Truton support, which actually makes it very easy on the eyes to read and when you're writing content, so that's great. And then you also have the touch bar, obviously, uh, which gives you dynamic controls, touch controls in different apps, and you also get that Touch ID Frequent Reader built into the touch bar, just like on the MacBook Air, but you know, we don't have a touch bar on the Air, just a fingerprint sensor. We also get four Thunderbolt 3 ports versus two on the Air and the non-touch bar MacBook Pro. The GPU is also better, the speakers are much better, and then you also get a T2 processor that a MacBook Air also has for theft protection when you're not connecting to Wi-Fi. Uh, Bluetooth 5.0 versus 4.2 on the non-touch bar MacBook Pro, so yeah, there's a lot of advantages that you get with this touch bar MacBook Pro. Also, the non-touch bar MacBook Pro hasn't been updated since 2017, whereas this one was just updated in May 2019. So for everyone that loves the 13-inch MacBook Pro or the MacBook Air form factor size and weight-wise, the 13-inch Pro is the most powerful Mac that Apple sells uh, in that form factor. The only downside that a 13-inch MacBook Pro with a touch bar has is that it doesn't have a dedicated GPU. So here's where the 15-inch MacBook Pro comes into play. This is Apple's most powerful laptop, and this was actually my MacBook or my Mac choice as well. Uh, so you can have an 8-core, up to an 8-core Intel i9 processor up to 5 gigahertz, up from uh, the 4-core one that a 13-inch Mac Pro has uh, with a touch bar. We can also have up to 32 gigabytes of RAM from 16, a dedicated AMD Vega 20 GPU, which is miles better than the integrated Intel GPU that a 13-inch Mac Pro has. Then you also have a larger display, 15.4 uh, inches versus 13.3 inches, and you also have up to four terabytes of insanely fast 3.2 gigabytes per second flash storage. In fact, the 15-inch MacBook Pro is more powerful than something like a 2017 iMac, and in some cases even more powerful than the iMac Pro. So if you need a portable desktop, then the 15-inch MacBook Pro is the best choice here. It offers a ton of performance uh, in a very light and portable form factor uh, for a 15-inch MacBook Pro, that is. Uh, there's no actual downsides to a 15-inch MacBook Pro aside from the very, very high price point, and the battery life isn't as good as on the 13-inch MacBook Pro due to the fact that it has an integrated, uh, sorry, dedicated versus the integrated GPU that a 13-inch has. So if you're a video editor that edits 4K videos or even 8K videos on a daily basis and also needs to be mobile, then definitely get a 15-inch MacBook Pro. It's an even better choice than actually any Windows laptop today for video editing because yes, Premiere actually got an update and it runs faster uh, on the maxed out 2019 MacBook Pro 15 inch in macOS than on any other Windows laptop. So if you're doing any game development but you're no longer a student, same thing here, uh, get a 15 inch MacBook Pro. If you're into music production and you have to be mobile, same thing here, get a 15 inch MacBook Pro. What I really love about a 15 inch MacBook Pro is that you can also turn it into a full desktop workstation by connecting it to a 5K monitor or even two of them. Yes, you can connect an eGPU and a ton of accessories. In fact, the 15-inch MacBook Pro also supports up to four 4K monitors uh, compared to just two on the 13-inch MacBook Pro. So personally, I work both at the office and my home and when I'm traveling as well. So yeah, for me, my 15-inch MacBook Pro is the best choice since I, I need that power with me wherever I am. Now, if you don't have to be mobile and you just need a very powerful desktop, something that's even more powerful than the 15-inch MacBook Pro, well, in that case, get an iMac. Check out our iMac 2019 versus MacBook Pro 2019 video where we compare everything from benchmark to thermals, displays, and more. Definitely check that video out. Uh, but yeah, long story short, the iMac 2019, even though it is still the exact same old design that Apple was using on the front since 2009, 10 years ago, we do get an 8-core processor that runs faster than the 8-core MacBook Pro 15-inch since, you know, we have better cooling on the iMac. Uh, and we also have a much more powerful GPU, the Vega 48 versus the Vega 20. So we get about double the GPU performance on the iMac 2019 versus the 15 inch maxed out MacBook Pro. And you also have that big 27 inch 5K display that just looks brilliant. So it is by far the best display that you can buy at a moment for video and photo production, especially because of that glossy panel, which pretty much no other monitor offers aside from the LG One's 5K. Um, but yeah, everything is crystal clear on this monitor and looks like printed paper. It's an amazing display. And also, if you care about portability, the iMac is actually, it's still more portable than a regular tower PC because you only have the display, that's the entire unit. So you can just pack the display, the power cable, the wireless keyboard, and the wireless mouse, and that's pretty much it, you're good to go. So I would recommend the 27-inch 5K iMac to anyone that needs something that's more portable than the 15-inch MacBook Pro. So photo and video editors, game designers, programmers, uh, 3D artists, the 2019 iMac is incredibly powerful and overall I think that this is the Mac 
that offers you the best power per cost. Again, check out our video for everything you need to know about the iMac and the 2019 MacBook Pro. Now, if you just want an iMac because you love having a beautiful all-in-one computer and you're mostly at home or your office and you just don't need a laptop, then get the 21.5 inch iMac. Also, get a 4K model when you do because 1080p is just, it's just so bad. Why is Apple still selling that? No, get a 4K model. Uh, at $1,300, you even get a dedicated GP on this, the Radeon Pro 555X, uh, which is the same one as in the baseline 15-inch MacBook Pro, uh, just with two gigabytes of GDR5 memory rather than four gigabytes. So if you have a small company or, you know, you're a freelancer and you just need a desktop for literally just yourself and you don't care about portability, you don't care about insanely high performance, you just need, you know, a desktop that actually offers better specs than a 13-inch MacBook Pro and very, very close in performance to a 15-inch MacBook Pro, then get a 21.5-inch iMac, like I said. Next up, we have the Mac Mini, and this is a very interesting computer because it's smaller than even a 13-inch MacBook Pro. However, it doesn't have a display built in or, you know, a keyboard or a mouse. So you have to buy all of those yourself. It's just a tiny, tiny box, but this tiny box actually has a ton of potential. So with uh, up to six core processors and the best connectivity that I've ever seen so far, with four Thunderbolt 3 ports and HDMI 2.0 ports that can also do 4K 60, two USB 3.0 ports, as well as a one gigabit ethernet port, which can actually be upgraded to a 10 gigabit ethernet port. The Mac mini is perfect for anyone that wants to build a Mac OS server. This is what I consider to be the best use case scenario for the Mac mini. I mean, yes, you can connect a 5K monitor and an eGPU and turn this into an iMac, but it would actually cost you more than just buying an iMac and it would also perform significantly worse. So I've actually turned our Mac mini into a server. So it's not a server at the moment, but it was a server up until like two weeks ago. So for about six months, Months, uh, that's how we used it. So the Mac Mini was connected to all the Macs in the office, and then you also have that 10 gigabit Ethernet port from which you can connect it to a 10 gigabit Ethernet switch or a 10 gig server. So small company owners, startups that focus mostly on video production, uh, the Mac Mini is a great tool to have. Just keep in mind that Finder in macOS is really, really glitched, and yeah, I do expect quite a few crashes and glitches here and there, uh, like we had, and that's why we stopped using it, by the way. But yeah, future versions of macOS software should hopefully fix this. Now, if you need even more performance than a 27-inch 5K iMac, then definitely go with the iMac Pro. With up to an 18-core Xeon processor, a Vega 64X GPU, up to 256 gigabytes of ECC memory, and yes, up to a four terabyte flash storage drive. Uh, the iMac Pro is the best option for very high-end video production, 3D modeling, and anyone that does a lot of scientific work and testing, uh, because it also comes with that ECC or error correcting memory, which would come in handy there. Also, we have four Thunderbolt 3 ports, four USB 3.0 ports, as well as 10 gigabit ethernet port by default. So I would recommend the iMac Pro to also small companies that need one very powerful machine that does all of their rendering and 3D modeling on. So you can connect multiple computers again to this, and then you can process all of that on the iMac Pro. Now, I wouldn't recommend the iMac Pro that much for video editing, to be honest, uh, unless you work exclusively with 8K Red Raw. But even in that case, the regular 5K iMac can already handle 8K Red Raw. So yeah, the iMac Pro, like I said, mostly for 3D modeling, animation, and scientific work for small to me even medium-sized companies. And finally, we have the big boy, the Mac Pro. So the Mac Pro isn't out just yet, but it will be out by the end of the year. And this is Apple's most powerful Mac. This is essentially a much more powerful iMac Pro that's, that's also upgradable. Okay, so the baseline starts from $6,000, but only gives you an eight core processor, Radeon 580X graphics, and 32 gigabytes of RAM. Now, so yeah, spec wise, this is, this is really, really bad. Considering that you also have to buy a separate display, a separate keyboard and a separate mouse. And this thing is significantly less powerful than the baseline iMac Pro. Uh, but at least you can upgrade those components in any way you want and you know, whenever you want along the line. If you want to do that, you can do it with the Mac Pro. You can't do it with the iMac Pro. For example, you can add a much more powerful GPU. You can replace the CPU and the RAM, uh, pretty much anything you want. And Apple even sells some modules, like the MPX GPU modules, which can give you up to 56.8 teraflops uh, of GPU compute power, which is the highest you can get in any desktop computer today. Now, by doing some quick maths on the component prices, I believe that a maxed out Mac Pro would cost you around $50,000 to $60,000 
at least. So yeah, the Mac Pro is definitely not for the average consumers. Instead, it is for production houses that have big budgets uh, of tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars in the revenue e every single year. Uh, and they don't care about spending 50K on a desktop computer, that's like nothing. So yeah, in fact, you can actually buy six of Apple's brand new Pro XDR displays that can actually uh, go with the Mac Pro. Six is what the Mac Pro supports maximum. Uh, and with those monitors, the Mac Pro would cost you well over $100,000. So yeah, if you're the CEO of a big video or music production company or studio, a maxed-out Mac Pro like this one can save you hundreds of, of thousands of dollars in renting time over time. But yeah, let me know in the comments which Mac would you pick, which one is your perfect Mac in your opinion for you. Uh, and if you want to buy anything, please consider using the links below. We have affiliate links, so we get a small commission from all the sales. You don't have to pay anything, but for example, Amazon gives us a small commission from their profits uh, on every purchase that you guys make. So that supports videos like this one and also support the channel. So uh, yeah, thank you for that. And also, if you want to see more in-depth tech videos like this one, do consider subscribing and enable notifications by tapping on a bell icon. Uh, but yeah, this, is, this has pretty much been it for this one. So yeah, thank you for watching. I'm Daniel, and I'll see you guys in the next one. It's an effect, signing out. Cheers.